Good afternoon, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, thanks for coming. This is the adopting a Drupal contrib first approach session. Thanks for thanks for joining me today. Um, we'll just come on and kick it off here a little bit. Uh, introduce myself. My name is Jason Want. I work for Nerdery as a principal software engineer, and I've been working with Drupal for about 10 years now. I sort of serve as a technical lead on an on an engagement with a client. Um, go into icebreaker. I was wondering if anyone, you've read the topic, you're here because you want to hear me speak about this topic. I wonder if anyone else has a story that they would like to share about contributing to Drupal, a patch or a complete module or just participating in issue queue while, uh, while working for a customer or perhaps a story from a customer um, Anyone like share a story? Anyone done anything like that before? Uh, all right. Well, that's all right. Well, how about you have a story you'd like to share? Not for the group experience, but I've pushed a couple of things in a couple of different modules for uh, Kafka. And while that was okay. uh, the first time I ever had a project where I was working on some project, there was something that Needed to be generalized. If you don't be served by the upstream modules and not by some app that I was used to writing. Great. So, an open source contribution. Um, how did that make you feel when you were doing that? Well, I loved it when I finally folded it in. I didn't have to. <laughs> Just keep supporting it? Uh, right. right re rolling it, maybe? Right. Um, yeah, that's a great, great story. Um, I was wondering who here is a Drupal developer, consider themselves a Drupal developer, or work for a Drupal provider? Um, all right, so those who didn't raise their hands, what do you consider yourself? Are you a customer, or what would you consider yourself? I don't think you raised your hand, right? Yeah. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do, you, I mean, I use a Drupal platform, but I don't really install so. Okay, sure. You're a, a central a user, the end user, right? That's great. Um, I, like I said, I work for Nerdery. Nerdery. This is a new vision statement from Nerdery. Um, I really like it. It came out this spring, and it just kind of runs central through the presentation, and I just wanted to share that with you all. Nerdery is a Drupal uh, consultancy, sort of specializing in platform modernization, IoT, cloud services, and collaboration to build your team and product. Um, Here's kind of the rough flat line. We're going to just talk about like a high level what it is um, and how I got there, like this working definition that I'm using, um, and talk about the benefits in the context of how I joined Nerdery, and I saw that there was a need for us to perhaps do this as a practice, and how I went about internally sort of selling it, the benefits of this approach to both to all the stakeholders, end users, uh, providers, and you know clients or consumers. And then how we do it. Just a little bit about um, the mechanics. Just get into a little bit about the mechanics, about how you would go about doing this, but not in any great detail, because I think there's other uh, topics out there that cover really in much better detail about how to contribute directly to the Drupal community. Um, all right, so let's go about the, the, this approach. So the working definition is basically you're taking everything that the community already does. We're already involved in the community. Uh, there's values and principles, there's a methodology behind it, and taking that and onboarding our clients and customers with the community and all those things that come with the community. Uh, our current people that are in the community and people that are not yet in the community, so maybe new prospects when you engage with a new company or a new potential customer who's not that familiar with the community. Onboarding them and then taking all those things and put it directly into your project work, and we'll get into that a little bit more here. Um, oh yeah, the previous picture I saw, these are random images I took throughout the New Orleans area. I'm from New Orleans, so I kind of just put them into the presentation because I think they're hot. Well, I enjoy them. This is a direct quote from Trees by Tart. He's the founder. Um, and you notice here, one of the things I bolded here is just, it's about technical and non-technical decisions, working collaboratively with everyone, all the stakeholders, and that is directly into our project work. Those are the same things that we can do. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but when I went to sort of talk about this concept, or, you know, we, I've done it in practice, but I never really put a name to it, but I wanted to talk about it in, with internal stakeholders at Nerdery, I went to what I'm familiar with, and I went back to the Drupal community as the foundation and seen what things are there already. 
And I, I went and found the values and principles and, and talk about the values of prioritizing impact and those two principles that go along with that. And directly, you know, when you look at these, think about your project work and th think about the end user, right? Prioritizing impact. We want end users who are using the platform to be able to do the work really well and do it quickly. And so think about these other values and principles in that context, right? Better together, collaboratively de making decisions. Um, here's the thing as well, striving for excellence kind of goes with knowing that change is always constant and, and taking that into your development methodologies and recognizing that change is always constant and doing things to set yourself up for things that are gonna always change. Uh, another value here, treat each other with dignity and respect. And there's a, a couple principles that go along with that. And that, you know, again, we, we, we follow these values and principles in the Drupal community, and we want to bring that directly into the project work and onboard our clients with that. And then lastly, enjoy what you do. If you're not having fun, you know, why do it? Um, so together, all of these make up sort of the foundation of the Drupal Contrib First approach and the practice you do with your portfolio or project work. So I started there, and I started telling people about this internally. And then and I needed to outline the benefits. Like, why is it worth doing this as a practice? And I kind of broke it down to the stakeholders. We've got um, the clients, the end users, the individuals, and the providers or agencies. And we'll start off with the clients here. And so I kind of broad stroke here. Basically, as you practice this approach, um, you're gonna increase the value delivered because you're gonna end up, as you engage with the community, you'll be delivering better quality solutions and things that will be forward compatible um, that will just enable and, and uh, enable our customers. And I break this down a little bit here with increased impact so that with this approach, as you're adopting it and putting it into practice, you're going to increase the impact because of your tighter engagement with the community um, and, and thinking about the end user, the content uh, administrators who are creating content so that they can do their jobs more effectively and, and really increase the impact that they're doing by delivering better results to their actual, their audience, right? So we got the end users who are working on Drupal, the content administrators, and then they have the actual, their audience who they're trying to uh, engage with. Increased quality here. Uh, I sort of mentioned that. So as you get engaged with the Drupal community, adopt their development practices, you're going to be more aligned with what's happening in the community and what Drupal's long-term roadmap is. You're going to become more familiar as a developer with all the APIs in Drupal and how to use them well so that your actual solutions that you create will become uh, better. And then here's another one, secure solutions. So that, you know, there's an emphasis here, contrib first. What people automatically think of is, you know, as you work with a new engagement, out of the blocks, you're thinking about contributing maybe a solution, a module or some other solution. Um, as you do that, instead of writing custom code that will never see the light of day outside of the project code base, you're gonna be working collaboratively and sharing that code out to a greater audience with increased visibility so that it becomes more secure you'll have fewer bugs, or those bugs will get solved more quickly. There's always bugs. But as a collaboratively working together, you'll, you'll get those worked out. Forward compatible as well. So as I mentioned, you know, with increased quality, you're actually becoming more aware with what Drupal's APRs are, how what not to do to break Drupal. For example, how not to you know, forget to render your cache tags so that you break Drupal's really great and smart cache and validation system. Um, but also, you'll keep the roadmap in mind as you're developing solutions or working with your clients to uh, prioritize what you're going to be working on. And then increase the extent. Again, going back, being more familiar with, a, with a Drupal's project code base, you'll be able to make your solutions, your custom solutions, more extensible, um, which will help deliver more value because as business requirements change, if you're building your solutions in a way that is forward compatible, and also extensible, you can quickly make adjustments when business requirements change. And then I've kind of filled in the details here, so if you look back on the slides, you can, you'll have that information available. 
I realize you can't really read that, a little small, but that's all right. On the flip side of increasing value delivered is lowering the cost of ownership. Back, I think, last December, I was starting to work with a new engagement, and I, and I was curious about what they thought the lifetime of their project was. And I asked them, what's their expected lifetime of that project? So I thought maybe they were going to, you know, when they're thinking about budgeting, maybe it's a 10-year, 5, 10-year uh, timeline, and they're planning to reinvest, maybe replatform in 10 years. And the answer I got was, we don't have a timeline. We're going to use it, essentially, in, until it stops working for us. And you think about that timeline, anything that you can do now, like making sure that it's forward compatible with Drupal 9 or 10 even, that you won't have to redo the work, right? You won't have to refactor as much as you try and develop solutions that are forward, main, uh, forward compatible, more maintainable, more extensible. And then also, lowering the cost of ownership, not just for your that particular engagement, sometimes we work with clients that have multiple engagements, multiple work streams that have similar needs, and that if you approach the solution in an abstract way and you maybe contribute, it's going to be a little more abstract and more reusable. And so immediately the next engagement will see and you know reduce costs because you can plug and play, maybe extend it, and you can reuse that solution. So reducing the cost of the next engagement or any other engagement that you can work with. Um, so just some bullet points here about lowering the cost. Immediately, like when we look for solutions, we go to Contrib to see what's available there. That's going to reduce costs automatically. Um, extending an existing Contrib solution with a patch or a feature or a submodule will help reduce the cost of the overall engagement. Compatibility, the first time I've kind of mentioned this already about increased value, but right, doing things so we're not breaking and having to redo things later six months down the road when the project launches and it scales up and you have to reconsider what, how, the solution you were doing. Um, reusability, mentioned that was already, kind of plug and play solutions, being able to reuse it, and um, reduced overhead. So this is one is where I talk about, you know, you think about Drupal as a community has practices and standards that we are working towards. Uh, as you become more familiar with them, you start bringing that into your project work. And the reduced overhead is because you can, uh, our customers can maybe hire internal engineers, internal devs. And if they're familiar with those practices, they'll spend less money trying to train them or get them up to speed on the exact sort of standards and syntax or whatever it is within that particular code base. If it adheres to something that's already been adopted by the community, people can come in, get ramped up, and contribute much sooner. For individuals here, um, this really focuses on the developer, the individual developer. Um, at Nerdery, as I was talking to internal stakeholders about this concept and this approach, I wanted to point out that there are many benefits to individual engineers and developers. Um, and and you know, go back to that first Drupal community uh, value. You know, focusing on impact uh, that. As we develop these solutions, and your story, right, you're, you're able to contribute to an open source community and, 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 and just feeling that reward of providing that impact and knowing that other people are going to be benefiting from that work. Individuals derive meaning from that. Um, right, generates purpose for us. Um, for individuals, there's additional learning opportunities. As you engage with a Drupal community, um, you know, that's why we're all here, really, to learn from each other. If you're in a workplace setting, you're not only just you're not limited to the people you work with. If you engage with a community with a Drupal contrib first approach, you're involved in the issue queues, but also involved in Drupal Slack. You're going to be learning from all those people you interact with. Um, and as you as you work with this approach, as you engage in the community, you're going to become much more proficient. You're going to be producing better uh, solutions. And these last couple of things refine soft skills. You know, there's the you know collaborating with the community involves some soft skills, communicating effectively, uh, being respectful, and things like that. So you'll be getting better at doing that as you engage the community, and all this kind of leads to your professional growth as an engineer. And lastly, we'll we'll talk about providers. Um, 
really it comes down to as an agency you know what's good for your customers and what's good for your team is ultimately going to result in, in, in good results for for the agency um, you'll benefit directly through that success you know you'll just continue to build on the success of your team members um, other things that benefit uh, providers you know as you engage with the community become more visible um, I mean, case point, you've probably never heard of Nerdery, but I'm here in front of you today. I'm engaging the community, and now that you've, you've heard about Nerdery. Um, another company, for example, take Media Current, for example, they're, they're listed on the top 30 contributors list that just came out from Dries this week. Um, definitely big brand awareness there. Uh, lead generation opportunity, and let's see what else we have here. Additional training opportunity. Right, so. As you engage in the community, you become more visible. You'll probably generate leads from that visibility, uh, your sponsorships, but also um, just on Drupal.org. Are you familiar with the Drupal.org Marketplace page where it lists the, it lists the contributors in rank order of their contributions? Um, very visible place for people to, to shop around to find out a partner. Um, additional training opportunity for your engineers. As I mentioned earlier, for individuals, you get to learn from the community. This is a perk really for agencies as well, right? That your engineers, your developers are learning outside of any direct input from, from you as an agency. Um, happy developers, increase uh, retention, uh, and then recruitment. As you engage with the community with this approach, you'll become more visible, and potentially you'll be able to hire directly from that visibility and that engagement. Um, again, keep in context, this, this is me trying to explain to Nerdy why this approach is really good and we should do it. So that's where this is coming from. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with this series, The Office and Michael Scott, win, win, win. It's definitely a win, win, win situation. I don't know if you're familiar with that episode, but I'll paint the picture here for you in case you don't know. I don't know, there's two characters, Oscar and Angela. They sit next to each other in accounting. Angela has a poster of these babies in diapers playing musical instruments and it's offensive to Oscar. Oscar wants it to get be taken down. She wants to keep it up. Michael says, well, well let's make a t-shirt out of the poster. Oscar will wear it so he doesn't have to see it, and Angela can enjoy the, the poster on the t-shirt. So it's a win-win-win. So we're going to transition into like some mechanics here, like how do you do it, or how is it being proposed, how I'm proposing it at Nerdery, and, and, and where we'll go from there. Um, sort of three tenets here, engage with the community, um, which we're doing, we're all doing, we're all here at the camp. Um, but it's also partnering with our clients to get them to engage with the community, getting them onboarded and cultivating these values and principles within our, our clients and customers and their stakeholders and their internal teams. And then adopting their approach, um, really taking those community values and principles and methodologies and boiling it into your project work. And we're going to go into a few details here. So engage with the community. You're, you already know. You're already doing it. You're here, right? So we'll just quickly go over a few things that you can and cannot do. I don't know if you, um, so you can, you're offline. You're at an event. Check that box. Online. Get involved in the online community. There's Drupal Slack and a few other online places. Um, User support and documentation, you can always get involved that way and contribute uh, just in Drupal forums. Drupal Slack is also a great way to you, you know, support. Oftentimes I go to the support channel in Drupal when I have a question and then I'll, and I'll engage and I'll try to answer a few questions and then I'll post my question and then engage with a few more until I get a response. So you can do support through that uh, forum. Uh, issue queues, that's where a lot of need, you know, we have, there's a big need there, just refining issues redoing the summaries, uh, relating issues. As you, you know, you're Googling, right? You found a bug and you're Googling and you're like, oh, this is coming up here, here, and here, but these issues aren't connected on Drupal.org. Well, adding related issue links is fairly simple. So you can go ahead and do that and help communicate the issue to other people. And then marketing, there's a Drupal, uh, there's a Promote Drupal initiative is another way to get involved and contribute engage with the community. And if you're not aware, there's a, there's a page on Drupal.org that lists all the ways you can contribute and engage with the community. It's called uh, Ways to Get Involved. Partner with clients. Um, now this is interesting. I don't know if you'll recognize the, the movie scene here uh, from Wizard of Oz. 
This is kind of where 10 years ago when I started working with Drupal, you know, I found all these great solutions in the contrib space, and I sort of felt a little bit like a wizard, right? Plugging in, making my clients' dreams come true, but not really telling them how the sausage was made, really, right? Um, so this is sort of an obstacle in communicating with our, with our partners. And one thing that we can do is we can develop a way to do that, develop a way to onboard our clients and our, their stakeholders to this approach and to the community. Um, developing a presentation. I recently have modified this presentation to internal audience at Nerdy, but then also with a client that I did about a month ago. We went on site and I presented to the product owner, the business analyst, and the complete uh, content team. And, and it went really well. They were really excited about it. Um, in fact, they were saying this is inspiring and they wanted to share it with other stakeholders at their company to reach a broader audience. And I followed up with them and soon they're gonna be creating a Drupal.org profile. So I think that's gonna be really exciting to be able to work with them in this, in this context. Um, and then communicating. So you get them onboarded, but then you're, you're, you're continually communicating uh, with them about what's happening in the community, about the camps, about the conferences, or even the upcoming release schedules, or the security release cadence, and any communication that's coming down. So just ongoing communicating them and telling them about the community. Um, collaborate. So when we're engaged with our project work, uh, you know, Drupal's values and principles, we're collaborating with our stakeholders to prioritize the project work. We know what's going on in the Drupal community, and we relay that information back. So maybe they don't want to invest, uh, they don't want to make an investment in this next sprint or this next sprint because something over here is going to be maturing and we can wait for that and invest our, our resources in a different solution at this time. So it's about ongoing communication and collaboration and then investing, just investing in that knowledge, always telling them what's going on and getting them uh, really, you know, getting them invested in the community and those decisions. Adopting this, you'll see this, I really like this image. It comes from a street in New Orleans. You'll see it. I have it in here too many times maybe, but it, it's, it's in there. Uh, so adopting the approach. This really is where I'll spend some more time just talking about how you take it and put it into your practice. And it comes from a lot of the, is Agile because as we'll see, Agile, you're collaboratively deci deciding on what to invest in in every sprint. Um, we'll talk about discovery and how we do that contrib versus custom, and then also this tool that you can use to decide on competing solutions. There's always more than one way to solve something, and there's always trade-offs. Um, so let's get into it here. Just a highlight over adopting the approach in Agile. Um, you'll notice if you look at these, if you're not, and try to think back at Drupal's values and principles, there's a lot of overlap, right? Um, individuals, interactions over process and tools. What we have here is sort of prioritizing impact, you're prioritizing your solutions on the impact of the individuals who will be using the solution and the audience that's going to be taking in the content, right? Um, think about accessibility in terms like this, right? You're prioritizing uh, individuals' needs over, you know, the technical solution. And then also treating each other with dignity and respect. That's also one of the principles, um, and that ties into that first uh, agile value as well. And again, three, customer collaboration. Again, just collaborating, communicating all the time. Agile also has values and they also have principles. And I just do a few bold ones here, uh, call it out. And you'll see that in the next few slides about how you take these, how you mash up Drupal's community values and principles into a process. And that process is um, sort of the discovery. I kind of just called out Spike. I don't know if anyone uses Jira or any other project management solution. There's a ticket type called Spike. Use that liberally. Um, if, you, if there's uncertainty or risk associated with something, use a spike so you can try and minimize the scope and make it more predictable. Um, and as we go through an agile discovery process, oftentimes you know, we use that spike. We really want to gather those business requirements from the stakeholders and understand them in terms of user stories, the actual the users and what they want to do with that solution. I think oftentimes um, we 
You know, we always focus on how it's going to be presented or how it's going to be styled or rendered. Uh, and we omit like how the CMS author is going to engage with that solution. If you can bake that into the business requirements, you're going to get something that comes out a little more robust because CMS users often want some flexibility with that solution. And to make something flexible, it requires something a little more robust that could possibly can be contributed rather than something that lives in the presentation layer or in a template. Um, once you gather those business requirements in terms of user stories, um, you know, you can use this method. There's many other methods out there. Moscow is that you divide it up in must have, should have, could have, and won't have. So as you go into a sprint, you're right. You say, these things we're not going to do yet. Let's put them in the backlog. Maybe we'll get to it in the next sprints, depending on how this other stuff goes, right? We may have resources available to get to those later. And then we get work on the ones that are prioritized. Um, I like to pause here because I like to come back to what we get out of the box. Um, and this has to do with when you engage with the community and you know the APIs well enough and you know what you're breaking when you, and how you break it, you realize that we get so much out of the box and sometimes we forget about it. You can take all these things that we get out of the box and you can make those business requirements, right? We don't break Drupal. It must be secure, it must be forward compatible, it must be highly scalable, and the list can go on and on. And as you talk about in terms like that, there will be trade-offs, you know, and we'll get to that into the decision matrix where some of these, you, you'll make decisions and you'll have trade-offs. But when you do, you can say those are won't haves and you put them in the backlog and maybe you'll get to them again later and you can advocate for them later. And then again, um, you take those user stories, you put them in terms like this so that your different stakeholders are accounted for in the business requirements and those can go directly into your JIRA tickets or however you're defining scope so that when you go back and test them, you're making sure you get all the, you get all the user stories accounted for. As an anonymous user, as an authenticated user, as a content author, right? You count for all those individuals in the requirements. OK, so once you have all the requirements, this is the approach. You'll find this on Drupal.org. It's a development methodology that recommends going to core. What can you do with config? Do you really need a custom controller to respond to requests to return JSON? Or can you use what's now in core, the JSON API? So some things we don't need to do anymore custom because it's baked in the core. And those things are going to be much more secure, right? Um, so see what you can do with Drupal core. Um, see what you can do just by extending Drupal core. If there's a bug or additional feature, engage in the issue queues. And you can do this as early as you get the requirements figured out. Think about a new engagement where you go through a process of discovery. Um, you do your research, right? You're trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to get this solution. And you find something that gets you 80% of the way there in core or contrib. Well, at that time, you can create an issue and in the issue queue on Drupal.org, specify the requirements, engage with the maintainers to help them sort of shape the solution. And that will reduce the uncertainty of that solution and help you get an estimate, but also help you get something that could possibly be contributed right away, something that they will accept right away because they're engaged with you from the beginning. So you get that on the board. And you'll see what happens. People will engage with you, and you'll develop something collaboratively with the community and the clients hand in hand. Uh, you can't get into core, contrib module. What's out in contrib space? Again, then you can extend the contrib module, the sub module, patch, et cetera. And then lastly, you know, maybe you're, well, not lastly, you can write a contrib module. You plan for it, you create a sandbox. You start breaking out the feature request in your sandbox issue queue so you can leverage issue credits and engage in the community in that way. And then lastly, if you can't get any of that done, and of course there's trade-offs, maybe there's it's time sensitive, this other stuff takes additional time. And it takes additional resources in the terms of time and money. So lastly, you can write a custom code. And then you know you can't contrib first, maybe you want to contrib after as an alternative. And here's the decision matrix that I talked about. When you gather your business requirements and you've developed competing solutions based on this approach, you end up maybe with three different solutions. 
And if you think about those things we get out of the box, those are your high level business requirements plus the client's business requirements, you can determine factors on how to score these solutions. So you create factors and then you'll weight the factors. For this particular feature request, this particular engagement, you know, what's really important to them is that we've got marketing campaign in the works and it's got to be on the site in two months. So time to implement is the most important. And of course, these can vary depending on the engagement. Then you go through and you score your solutions with your client or with your team and well, well everyone. And then you add them up and you sort of are able to highlight a particular solution based on points and the factors that the client has determined to sort of give them a better sense of where their investment is going to go. Right? If they're competing solutions like something very custom in the theme layer versus something contributable, something that's more robust and can be reused, they can see the value. Like you could have another factor here, well, extensibility or reusability, right? Maybe that's really important for that client. So this is a tool. I, I, I propose this internally as a way to like, uh, help us make decisions if the case is ha comes up. I actually haven't used this tool in a, in a project work yet, uh, just putting that out there. But I think it could be used. Uh, when I did the presentation with a client, I showed them this, and they were like, yes, we could actually use this internally because they end up, the product owner and the business analyst, you know, they wrangle in all the other stakeholders and all of their requirements because they're managing a platform and they have competing interests and they can use this internally um, with, their, with their constituents. So again, uh, here is the, the working definition. Um, it's, you know, it's just taking everything that's already there and bringing it into your project work and engaging your clients and onboarding them with this approach. Because at the end of the day, what they'll end up is better solutions that deliver more value and lower the long-term costs of that engagement or future engagements. So this is what I've been doing over the past year. I've been advocating for this internally. I've been speaking at events. Um, and I'm wrapping up then some documentation. And now we're at a point at, at Nerdery uh, where we are gathering feedback. If you have feedback, I'd love to talk to you. We are working out some of the finer details about how to, the mechanics of actually how to maintain a, a module that has been supported by a customer and some of those finer details about uh, copywriting, uh, branding of that on the project page and some of those other things and long-term maintainership, how, we, how do we be good stewards of those projects that we do contribute so things don't just end up out there uh, that says they're being maintained, but they're not, for example. Um, and then we're just going to be trying to, like I said, we're engaging with our cu customers now, our clients now, to get them on board and seeing where that goes. And we'll just mix and repeat and refine this approach. Um, so, yeah, I realize I just blew through that uh, at a rather quick pace. But uh, if anyone has any feedback or immediate questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Paul. Uh, so, how have clients reacted to this when uh, you say you want to, to contribute something that you developed uh, that a client hired you to develop? How, how have you? What kind of reactions have you got from clients? Yes. So, like I, uh, I, I did a version of this to the client, and they were actually quite. Uh, they were ready, and they needed to get buy-in from un, um, individuals, uh, you know, who they reported to to make sure that they're, when they put their brand out there, I think it's more about, um, more about putting their brand out there and associate with work that's not directly tied to what they do um, was the number one concern. The, they, saw, they saw the immediate benefits of doing this approach and they were on board. Um, part of that presentation included showing you know, the Dries' annual report on sponsorship. And, you know, fortunately my client is not a direct competitor with Pfizer, for example, because this probably would not have gone over so well, but I was able to show how Pfizer has been directly involved in supporting things like content moderation and whatever else they are contributing to. And so they were able to see parallels between them and their, uh, you know, the, the market and the vertical that they're in 
and being sort of on the front end of digital competency and they wanted to actually be associated with a strong brand like Drupal. Um, so it was very positive and that's just that's the only one we've actually been engaged with directly. And if we go back to um, well, there's a lot of transitions here. Maybe we won't do that. Well, let's see. I won't be able to do that either. If we go back to this slide where we talk about engaging with and partnering with clients. Okay. So these bullet points here, these do not have to be linear. And that's not, I haven't done this linearly. I started doing communicating, collaborating to build awareness uh, and investing. And then I did the presentation. So I got our current uh, client and stakeholders familiar so that they could immediately see the benefit. Um, there was a time last fall, this client needed to pivot very quickly. They used a contrib module um, to display sort of a, no, it was more of a custom module actually. A custom module display, uh, they make consumer products and they have a button on there is where to buy. And they had a third party integration. You click on where to buy, it will show you that product and the locations where to buy it. And they wanted to change, they wanted to run a pilot program to change vendors. Um, and in that initial discovery, using a spike ticket, we said, oh, here's a module. It gets us 80% of the way there. And then there's these six bugs, which we've already reported or already have been reported in the issue queue. And it's going to take this much time to fix those bugs. Or here's another custom solution that will take more time, actually, at that point. And so through those experiences, eh, they automatically see the benefits of an approach like this, because we had success stories, case studies to point to. Um, and so they're readily on board. Their reservation was about sort of attaching their brand to the space, I think. And then once they sold it up internally, we've gotten the nod, and now we just need to create that profile. But I'm happy to report once we sort of share this further what, what those stories like, because I think they will vary. I don't know if you have any other experiences that you can share. Uh, uh, I had one client who was very concerned about uh, revealing his proprietary information in competition. That, that was a, a trust building exercise. Right. So as long as you're communicating and collaborating on an ongoing basis, I think you establish that trust right away. And there are proprietary solutions that we have for this client that we are not contributing. It's just some things can't be contributed because they're too close to the business core values and how they derive value for their products and their brand that cannot be contributed. Uh, go ahead. How do you delineate like something that the client wants that could be useful maybe to a handful of people, whether that's work putting in the contrib space uh, versus something that's obviously trip worthy and everybody would benefit from. You know, like there's a lot of extra effort that goes into something just to get you know, get it in the hands of a few people who might use something. You know. Right. So uh, to let me see if I can rephrase the question. How do you decide when something is worth contributing because of the extra effort involved in contributing something? So how it's specifically or it's kind of catering to a specific use case for client already, but you know, how do you decide whether that's something that the rest of the contrib will even about wants and the Well, I sure you can't really measure whether or not something is going to be used um, once you contribute it, unless you've had conversations and know. But if it's not out there, it's definitely not going to be used. Um, and the other benefits of adopting this approach is not just for the contribution part. You're getting all the other things, right? You're getting uh, 
uh, improved quality, you're getting ex more extensibility, more maintainability, because you're, when you do that, you're automatically sort of adopting these practices into your, into your production work. Um, if there is, um, but those decisions aren't made by an engineer, a single engineer. Those decisions aren't made by the development team. They're made collaboratively with uh, the, the client. If they know, you know, we don't, we tell them, it, you know, there's a couple of solutions here. I, do, I was recently involved in a, an engagement SOW where we presented two solutions. And the way we described them is like, this one's way more robust. You're not going to need an additional code deployment. Uh, you're not going to need additional development hours if we invest on the front end and we put it out there. They, they made that decision. They saw the value in it. Um, but there's always contrib after, too. If the client is not on board with something, but you feel, well, there's also, it's like your own personal trophy, too. You know, you want to get it out there. It's like, hey, I did this. Come look at it. You can always get permission as well from the clients to contrib after. But then they're going to want that up. They're going to, you know, as soon as it starts getting updated, they're going to want those benefits to come back into their project. And you can always communicate that at that time as well to help them, you know, Put, them on the, put that on the decision matrix so that they can see that more visibly, that, oh, you're not going to get the additional improvements later because it's going to be much more harder to, to bring it into your code base. You have a question? Well, I did about the matrix, uh, the decision matrix. So I noticed a, a, a column that I know my clients are very sensitive to, which is box. Uh, and uh, I think it's kind of ties in what you're saying about it takes a certain amount of effort to make something either generic enough to fit a broad use case or right. not be very specific to your, to your use case. How do you project that cost and explain it to the customer? Like in terms of main maintenance? Like if something comes up later? Like just initial development time. Because that, I mean, at least most of uh, my circumstances, you know, the customer wants to put something out there. Here's how much money they have to spend. Here's when they want it to launch. Get it done. Right. Um, well, going back to just the example I said, um, how do you, so let me rephrase the question. So how do you communicate the additional costs? Well, I think you, you communicate in terms of benefits and not cost, but investment and the value within the solutions. You present both to them. Just go ahead and present both of them pros and cons of each, and let them decide. Of course, we're not going to get, I don't think, I mean, I've been in situations where like, no, we can't, we can't do that. We can't spend that time, that money on that solution. Not, I mean, you just, okay, and you'll just move on to the next opportunity. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't surrender. I, wouldn't, I would just keep delivering options uh, and, see, and see where it goes. Uh, so just communicate in terms of value and benefits and then point out the risks associated with those things as well and let them decide. Any other questions? Yes. So I'm curious about the point you threw out for business owners about retention in the team. Do you have any data or experiences around this or do you just have a gut feeling like I do? Uh, it's more of a gut feeling, uh, but it's anecdotal from conversations I've had with people. And I think if I, I might have had, you know, the um, Stack Overflow does an annual developer survey. And I think I have sort of gleaned some information from that actual survey data that supports that statement. I'll, have, I'll be sure to reference that next time because it does, uh, I don't have anything. I'll, after, this, after the session, I can share with you that slide and show you the information I have. I mean, I know from my own team when we actually go through exercises like that, when they see things grow on their D.0 profile, they, they do feel good, and it makes them much more committed to the cause and the company. So uh, subjectively, I think you're absolutely correct. I'm just curious whether there's any data. To support it. I firmly believe you're right. I just haven't seen any hard data around it yet. Yeah. Um... It'd be an interesting survey. And I think that I'm going to pull that slide up because I think I have in my speaker notes maybe a, a note about that. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone.